what's what's the place where the the clergy hang out? Is it the is it called the cloister? Anybody know? I was going to say the cloister. It's very, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Anybody know? The vestry. Yeah. The vestry. I see if we had a vestry, I could make my entrance and say good morning, <laughs> church. And we'd all have to stand up as well. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, let's just uh, open up in prayer. Lord, again we. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, that um, you haven't left us as orphans, Lord. You have given us your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Lord, to guide us into all truth. And you've given us your word, Lord, so that we can know you, the one and true God, and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate. So, Lord, we're so thankful for these things, and we pray by the Holy Spirit that you reveal yourself through your word, this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I often think um, about us as a, as a fellowship, you know, what, what have we tried to achieve over the years, 20 odd years now we've been coming here. We used to be able to run up them steps at one time. <laughs> now I'm nearly on crutches. Nah. And... Uh, I think if, if anything, we've all tried to look for the purity of the word, isn't it? And how to apply that as, as a fellowship onto our lives, how to fellowship one together and focus on the fact that we are really all imperfect. The fellowship that they came from before was like uh, we are this superior people, and we are in, in Christ, but nothing of our own. And um, I think that can read a little bit of uh, this idea, one above the other, like, you know, I'm more holy than you, and then you'll get, you know, looking down on people and thinking, oh, look how weak they are, they didn't do this. And you can get all this kind of backbiting and stabbing and gossip going on. But I think if we recognize the fact that we are weak, but he is strong, and because we are in him, we are strong, and we... We, we recognise our imperfections. So I can never say to you, oh, look at you, because I know I'm imperfect as well, and I know I fail the Lord each and every day. But, uh, you know, as we sang, our faith is built on nothing less you know, than Christ's righteousness at the end of the day, nothing that we do. And over the years, we've, you know, we've had our ups and downs, we've had our falling outs, but I think we've really bred like a kind of a family kind of failure that we look after one another and we are concerned for one another and we, we look in for the best for each other and the concern is there and the love is there. And I think that is the main thing, that kind of love, isn't it? You know, it's Corinthians 13, above every other gift, love is the most important. But it's not a wishy-washy love either. It's not a love that overlooks the fact Look what you're doing, Linda or Thomas or Mark. It's bad for you. You need to stop doing that. Not that we are, you know, sort of judging people hypocritically, but we want everybody to get over that line, don't we, at the end of the day? We're in this race, and it's not so much a race as I keep saying, it's a marathon, and we've got to pay it so sad. We, we look in, we hear for the long haul, not the 10 yard dash, and then be exhausted and then fall to the way. And, um, I think we try to rid ourselves of tradition. As you know, I've said about tradition in the past, that there are traditions that nullify the word of God and we've got to be very, very careful about them and we denounce them. And then there's traditions which don't nullify the, the word of God, but they can be harmful in a sense. Uh, or they can be weighty to carry and they're not necessary. And then we have traditions which are okay. Like, we can enjoy a tradition. You know, Jesus, as you know, went up to the festival of lights and he the dedication of the temple. He enjoyed it. Um, and he was the first one not to want to put any kind of heavy, weighsome burden on people. In fact, he said, joining me on my yoke and I'll help you kind of thing, you know. And I think that's the thing we try to look at. And in fairness, when we talk about these traditions, uh, some people who've gone to fellowships for a long time, and you know, they, 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 these traditions can be inbuilt, and it can be quite offensive when we talk against that kind of tradition. But 
It's not that we want to be offensive. It's we want you to know the freedom and liberty that is in Christ. Not to sin, as you know. But to, you know, not to burden ourselves. And that's what Jesus done. He wanted to unburden the, the Jewish nation from these man-made traditions and this almost man-made religion of, of Judaism, which wasn't pure at the time by any means. And it was nothing more than a burden for the people. And I think that's basically what we try to do. Like we don't have meetings upon meetings. Now, I've got no problem with more than one meeting. But we, you know, really, realistically, looking back at the early church, um, I always thought that you know, the first day of the week is a working day. So they probably met in the evening and they possibly did. Some um, theologians I've been listening to say that they actually met very, very early before they went to work. So uh, we're going to start getting up at four o'clock in the morning to be more biblical now on Sunday. Well, we don't work on Sunday anyway. But so you know, um, I don't want to. You know, I, my grandmother she used to go to an Elan Pentecostal church in Pontypridd uh, there in, back in the old days, and uh, there was meetings after meetings after meetings, and she always in meetings kind of thing. And my mother got sick of it to be perfectly honest and walked away from you know Christ thank God that she you know walked back to it in later life but um, I don't want to burden anyone with you know meetings upon meetings and even down to putting another meeting on once a, a week once a month you know sometimes you come home from work and I understand I used to work you're tired and the last thing you want to do is get up in the evening and go out but this can be for our own benefit. And that's why I want to make it light and not burdensome so that we come together, we'll have a, a short time of study, hopefully, and then we have a time of fellowship with one another because we don't see each other long enough. So what am I, what am I talking about? I don't know, really. It's not, not what I come to preach this morning, to be honest. But uh, the idea is, is that we church should be something that you want to come to. If you don't want to come, you shouldn't be here, to be perfectly honest. Um, sometimes we just got to make the effort. I got to make the effort sometimes. You know, we all have to make the effort. I know what it was like when I was working and I was tired and, you know, I didn't, it was cold all day out in the MOT bay and then you, you come home and you have your food and then the last thing you want to do is go out again. You just want to crash out on the, on the sofa and watch the box or just fall asleep. So it, it was never my intention to, make anything burdensome. So the point is, you come here one day a week, you fulfill the needs of, script, of Scripture that we meet together, which some are not in the habit of doing, as, as, as uh, the writer of Hebrews said. But, um, and then if you want other meetings, there's plenty of churches that, you know, do midweek meetings and evening meetings, and we're not in you know, opposition to them as long as they, you know, they, they teach in the truth and stuff like that. So it's not a problem. As you know, sometimes I go to another meeting on a Sunday night in a local fellowship. But it's you, we're here to not burden some you. I think that's the main outlook that we've had as a fellowship. And, you know, as far as leadership is concerned, it's never been about lordship. You know that. It's, it's about being servants, isn't it? So I know Martin's got to get away, so let's get on. So anyway, what we're looking at uh, today is the churches of Revelation again. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Revelation, chapter 2 and verses 18. Revelation 2, 18. And it states this, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit 
adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, Also, as also I received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has a year, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, you know, it's been a while since I've been talking about the, the churches of Revelation. This is another actual church, and it was, it was basically, geographically speaking, there's a place called Asia Minor, which today we know as modern-day Turkey. Now, Thyatira, what does the name mean? Um, in a biblical time, it meant a perfume sacrifice of labor. Now, according to Arnold Fruchtenbaum, he claims it means continual or perpetual sacrifice. Both basically all agree that it has some connotation to sacrifice. So keep your uh, finger in Revelation 2.18 because we're going to basically analyze this chapter verse by verse. And interestingly, in verse 18, we have the one place in the book of Revelation that uses the title Son of God. This is used basically to emphasize Christ's majesty or of Christ's person. Um, possibly pointing to the fact that, you know, he alone is to be worshipped. Now, you notice it's talking about his eyes of flaming fire. Most eschatologists believe that this indicates that he sees all and his feet of burnished brass indicates the swiftness that he will pursue all that is evil and possibly all that he will tread down in his judgment. Now, verse 19 gives us a commendation of this church, uh, those things that they were doing correctly. So we can learn from this, yeah? The items that were considered praiseworthy Christian qual well, qualities are love, this is the greatest quality, as I've already said, faith for continual trust, uh, trust and reliance on Christ, and then we have service, uh, for basically that's the outcome of true faith, isn't it? The fruits that we produce out of a thankful heart because of our love for Christ. Now, patience or perseverance is required basically for our steady progress. Like I say, we, we're in a, um, a marathon, aren't we, you know? So we need to persevere. Um, I know I, I've done a little bit of running and never had the lung power for it, to be perfectly honest. I could probably run for about 30 minutes. But I have felt reaching the wall when you, you run out of blood sugar basically and your body wants to turn over to his fat stores and you hit this wall and you think oh gosh I've had it and it's the end and then suddenly you break through and your body switches over to his fat reserves and you can continue again the second wind as they call it so we need to persevere a steady progress like I said it's more important than an explosive start um, in fairness to this church in its contrast with Ephesus, if you remember, that they lost their first love. And instead of progressing, they were sliding back or backsliding. No, this church was doing more now than they did at first. So there was, you know, much to commend Thyatira. And then we come to the condemnation, verses 20 to 21. Now, some of which related to a woman called Jezebel. Now, most theologians agree that this is just a symbolic use of the word. She wasn't actually called Je Jezebel, uh, much as we would use it today. You know, she's a Jezebel kind of thing. Probably the two names that Christians wouldn't use are uh, uh, Judas and Jezebel, I guess. Is there two Js? And yet Judas really was a, a, um, a really f uh, common name at the time of Christ because uh, 
Judas Maccabeus, wasn't it? He was, a, he was a, you know, a warrior and a leader and everybody looked up to him. But of course, Judas Iscariot put the end of that. So anyway, it's a symbolic use of the name and it's associated normally with like bad behavior, if you know the story. I doubt that any Jew would have used it knowing its association with the evils done by Ahab's wife, isn't it? Je Jezebel had become the proverbial word for wickedness. Now it's interesting that this woman, obviously claiming to be a Christian, prophetess, which the biblical Jezebel wasn't, is nevertheless leading the people astray, specifically into some sort of ritualistic eating of food sacrifice, uh, sacrificially offered to idols. Now some may think that there is a, a kind of a contradiction here with you know Paul's teaching, and he said you can eat anything from the marketplace, you know, with good conscience and Somebody offers you food that, you know, it's questionable. You just eat it with good conscience unless they say, oh, this is sacrifice to idols. Like, and it's look, you know, so you would abstain kind of thing. Common sense stuff again. But as we know, idols are nothing and there is only one true God. Of course, this is not what's going on here. The offering to idols had become a religious ceremony with the idol becoming the focus of worship. And this, as the name suggests, is nothing more than idolatry, which is condemned by Scripture, which is in Exodus 20, verses 4 to 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now we could go off into and say, look at the established churches, they've got their idols and all the rest of it. And yeah, they have, and you know, they try to say, well, they're not idols really, they're icons. So they rename it. But at the end of the day, I think it's pretty emphatic from Scripture that we shouldn't be bowing down to anything that's been created by man's hands. We should only be bowing down in a worship kind of thing to God himself. So Jezebel was a Sidonian princess who became the wife of, of Ahab, the king of Israel. You can read the story in 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, 29 onwards. She was responsible for introducing um, a pagan religion into Israel that surpassed all the, the previous sins of idolatry in the northern kingdom. Now, idolatry in the northern kingdom began with Jeroboam the first, the first king. But there was a difference between the sins of Jeroboam and the sins of of Baal worship, as it's called, introduced by Jezebel. The sins of Jeroboam were a corruption of a true religion, and Jeroboam set up a golden calf in Dan and Bethel. But these golden calves basically represented the God that brought them out of the land of Egypt. Still bad. You know, God didn't like it. Um, it's basically they were prostituting themselves, if you like, because... Who was Israel in God's eyes? His wife. So when they were going after other gods and idols and all the rest, what were they doing? Committing adultery. But it's idolatry. But it was a corruption then of the true Yahweh worship. i got to get this off my chest. Why am I saying Yahweh rather than Yahweh? Or why don't I use... We've gone over this so that nobody really knows with concrete 100% certainty how to pronounce, oh, it's gone now, the tetragrammaton. Who remembers what that means? Ah. Oh. Yeah, it's Y H O. What does tetragrammaton mean? Tetra means four grammar words or letters. Four letters, Y H W H. So why am I using Yahweh rather than Yahweh? Well, if you remember, the uh, I'm going right off track. Yeah, if you've got to go, you've got to go. Right? <laughs> um, in in the, in the uh, Hebrew, it was Yod Hey Vav Hey, right? The four letters, that's how it's pronounced. So there's no W sound. So how can it be Yahweh? So we got a V sound, we got a Y sound. And we got a H sound, so Yahweh seems to be the problem. But it doesn't matter. So where am I going here? Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> so anyway, just as a real Jezebel had led Israel into the worship of other gods, in 
and, and in fact led them into a, a complete pagan religious system rather than corrupting the religion that was already there that you know would surpass all the sins that had been committed beforehand. So Jezebel was introducing paganism into the body of Christ and ultimately into some kind of sexual degeneration which was often the case with paganism whenever you, you I don't know if you think about it all the time, but when you see and hear paganism, it's about people dancing around with no clothes on and stuff like this, and it's always got some kind of sexual connotation. And you have to ask, how could this happen? Well, it's been suggested, and it, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, again, this is not concrete, but I think it kind of fits the bill. In this region, which was quite... Industrious, they were famous for their um, purple cloth and dyeing techniques. You remember Lydia? She came from this area. It's been suggested that due to the many guilds present in the business circles there, in order to trade successfully, you would have to belong to one or more of them, with the membership resulting in attending guild banquets and thus in turn eating meat sacrificed to idols. So what's a Christian to do? If you do not conform, you didn't get any business. Maybe this is how the Jezebel character introduced paganism into the congregation. It wouldn't really be much of a step to introduce something you'd already compromised on in your workplace back into the congregation, isn't it? And, you know, today with churches becoming more organized, more institutionalized, and therefore more monetarized because it's, it's, it's all project building and empire building. As you, know, you know, there's nothing emphatically wrong with having a, a building to house the church, but it's a burden, isn't it? Once you start talking about building projects, we got to get money. So then what happens then in most of the fellowships, all of a sudden now they reach back to Old Testament practices of giving 10% of your wages and stuff, and then an offering on top, and these kind of things. So you, now it becomes a worry about getting enough money in to keep the building project going, which I know firsthand was a heavy burden. So, you know, money became extremely important to the business's church's survival, then, of course, you get these things creeping in, these compromises creeping in. The leader has to focus on now what the congregation wants as, a, as opposed to what it needs. So I'm here now to make you happy. I can make you happy and clappy. Maybe you put more money in the box. You know, you know this kind of idea. And, uh, I mean, we, we see it, really. Let's keep the ears tickled. Let's keep people joyful. Let's not upset them. And on goes a compromise. Not that we're here to make you miserable and hot <laughs> and unhappy. <laughs> so, but how do we keep a congregation happy and therefore the money flowing? Well, the answer in a business model is to feed the flesh, isn't it? Uh, give them what they want. Give them theatrical productions, you know, smoke machines and all the rest of it, light shows and so on. And, uh, you know, I... <laughs> There was one uh, prominent church leader um, from one of these new movements, NAR, I think they call it, New Apostolic Restoration. And they actually went round the, the, his local town, basically putting out questionnaires, what do you want your church to be like? So what they ended up with is a church with a McDonald's in it. And if it was in the valleys, we'd probably have a bar over there so we could get a couple of pints. And restrooms, where if you get bored with the speaker, you can go and have a sleep. If you want to sleep, by the way, you're welcome to do it. I know you need to. You've been up all night looking at the stars, probably. <laughs> okay, so in comparison, Jesus' business model would have been disastrous. Turn to John, keep your finger in, in uh, Revelation, but turn to John chapter 6, um, 53. You know, they're all following Jesus. Oh, look, he's, you know, he's raising the dead and he's blind and receiving his sight. The deaf are hearing and they're all, you know, think this is fantastic, which it was. 
all excited. The crowds are swarming around him, fetching the sick to him. And then he goes and preaches it and spoils it all, doesn't he? And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, this is John 6, 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which come down from heaven, not as your fathers ate, the manna and the dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in a synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And look at the reaction. Therefore, many of his disciples, when he heard, heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? So then Jesus goes on to say, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, this is not just the twelve now, there's lots following, the disciples just following Christ. He said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. Here's the thing again, I keep seeing this over and over in, spirit, in the Scripture, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Wasn't worried about offending people, was he? Wasn't worried about how it might affect the offering. Now, how many in the mega churches you see today would follow the real Jesus and therefore the real Christianity? What would happen to pick one prominent teacher, if you can call him that? Joel Austin, have you seen his church? It's bigger than any American football auditorium. It's massive. There's thousands. In fact, they've got to get the police in to direct the traffic on Sunday morning. That's how many people go there. And all he preaches is how great you are. It's motivational speaking, not preaching. And they'll chuck a little bit of Jesus Christ into it for good measure to make it sound like it's some sort of church meeting. But what would happen to Joel Austin if he started to preach self-denial instead of promoting his own self? Now, this Jezebel spirit, this compromise with the world, has infected virtually every Christian congregation. You can't even go to some churches that have been around for centuries and were sound doctrinally without seeing the world's influence in them. You know, I, I went to a Baptist church and, uh, you know, it was fairly formal. It was okay. And everybody went, then it goes back to it a couple of years later. And now we've got all the bells and whistles. What's it all about? Well, this is the formula that gets people into the fellowship. It gets bottoms on chairs, basically. This is what the people want. So we want a big congregation. Well, I'd rather have two people that are sold out for God than 200 people that are just there for the flashing lights and the smoke, to be perfectly honest. Actually, I'm starting to talk about the Laodicean church. So let's get back on track. In, in verse 21, the Lord's judgments, it says, back in Re uh, Revelation, the, the Lord's judgments are not hasty, he said. And I give her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. So the church persisted in her wrongdoing and ignored the grace that always comes. God always said, change your mind and come back. And that's how we are to be no matter what heinous thing a brother or sister had gone into, and it's happened to you, and they've come to me, and they said, well, I said, okay, we've all fallen. Get up and keep on going. Don't look behind. But ignore, to ignore the grace offered. And so what happens? So comes the punishment. In fact, the Lord threatened to use this assembly is a solemn example to all churches, and we're going to get into that later on, because all these actual churches have a prophetic relevance to the churches that will come in the future. So when we finish up this series of the seven churches, then we're going to 
put all of these things together and show what's happened through the centuries. Very useful, so we don't fall into the same trap. Anyway, so this goes to, as an example to all the churches, not to tolerate evil. Jezebel, I, I said, is going to bring death to her children. Well, the children, it don't really mean children. It's followers of Jezebel. That's what they're talking about. Would be sentenced to tribulation. That's our word that's coming up all the time at the moment, isn't it? And death. Idolatry and you know, compromise are in the Bible, you know, pictured as fornication and unfaithfulness to marriage vows. Like I said, the, the Jews were the wife of Jehovah. So who are we? The bride of Christ, isn't it? So it's, it's pictured as fornication and unfaithfulness. Now, Jezebel's bed of sin would become a bed of sickness. To kill with death means to kill with pestilence in uh, other versions of the Bible. God would judge the false prophetess and her followers basically once and for all. Now, verse 24, not everyone in assembly was unfaithful to the Lord, and he had a special word for them. There's always a remnant in, a, in amongst a bad church, people who were holding fast to the word. They had separated themselves from the false doc the doctrines, first off, and, and the compromising practices of Jezebel, and her followers, which Christ Christ denounces the depths of Satan. The Lord had no special demands to make. He simply wanted them to hold fast in their resistance to evil. And it's something we're going to have to learn because things are going to get worse. Till I come refers to Christ's return for his people at which time obviously we reward them for their faithfulness. This is the first mention of this in uh, Revelation of the Lord's coming for the church. I think this is talking about the um, the rapture, to be perfectly honest. But in contrast, the reference in Revelation is in uh, 17 is to his actual return at the end of the tribulation to defeat his own enemies and establish his kingdom. Now, the believers in Thyatira promised authority over the nations, which probably relates to the fact that God's people will live and reign with Christ and when the Lord set, sets up his kingdom on earth, it will be a righteous kingdom with perfect justice. He will rule with a, a rod of iron. And rebellious men will be like clay pots, easily broken to pieces. And finally, in verse 27, Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star. Revelation 22, 16. The promise in Revelation 2, 28 suggests that God people shall be so closely identified with Christ that it will belong to them. But perhaps there's also an allusion here to Satan. There's an important point here who wanted the kingdom for himself and who offered, the, if you remember, the world's kingdoms to Christ if he would only but worship him once. Now in Isaiah 14, 12, Satan is named as Lucifer, okay? Which is, if some people say it's Hebrew, but it's actually Latin for brightness or bright star. Now, the compromise in people in Thyatira were following the depths of Satan, which would lead to darkness and death. God's overcomers, on the other hand, would share the morning star. So what do we learn from this con church congregation? Jesus is the bright and morning star, and Lucifer, the correct translation for Lucifer, would be bright star. So we got this close association. And I believe it is a, a deceptive subtlety here. In 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3, it states, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring them on themselves with destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For, for a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. It's interesting to know how these destructive heresies will be brought in. The word secretly, yeah? Now I know you've heard this, but I'm going to tell you again. The Greek for that is para Isaac's usesen. Honest. 
para Isaac usa inen. Okay? Now, you hear the word para, it means something alongside or with. So, a parachute, for argument's sake. You come in with a shoot, hopefully, because if you don't open, you're going to be in a, a right pickle. So it's putting something alongside something, right? It has the idea of laying alongside something or coming with something. Destructive heresies will come in by laying truth alongside error. Now, I don't know if you remember the, the Jim Jones um, thing down in Florida, and they all shot off to they opened, put a fellowship down in uh, South America. People's temple, they got them all to drink poison and they all killed themselves. And the way they got the children to take the poison was to mix it with a, like a pot, basically. I think, uh, can't remember what it's called. Oh, yeah, Kool Aid. They mixed it with something called Kool Aid. Have we got Kool Aid over here? I don't think we are. Anyway, it's like, uh, it's, a, it's like pot, basically. Like. So they mix that with it. So the pot tastes nice. You take the, the poison, don't you? And that's what false teachers do today. They give you scripture, which seem to be saying one thing, because they're using them out of their context, but in context, they actually mean something else. You may think that, you know, this fellowship is paranoid about error, but as we can see from history, the church was plagued with error right from the conception. We will see that these churches of Revelation are not, like I say, just not actual churches, but all these errors that they form are actually part and parcel of church movements through the ages and not just individual churches. It's a sad fact that most of the visible church out there today is corrupted in some way or is heretical in another, or both. Did you notice another method to deceive mentioned there? In verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. What is covetousness? If I've got a, an Aston Martin, William yes, looks at it. Ooh, I, want, I want one of them. How has he got that? I want it. Yeah? Greed. The want of more or, and or the things that other people own. Isn't that the exact things that these TV evangelists portray. They show off their extravagant lifestyle. Many, as you know, own fabulous mansions, private jets, their own airfields, and so on and so forth. They show all this stuff and tell you this is the secret of successful Christian walk with, with God. And you can have the same. What are they doing? They're generating a covered in mentality in you. And then they will tell you the secret to having more. Do you want more, Charles? Well, all you have to do, brother, is plant a seed. Plant 10 pounds and God is going to give you 100 pounds back, the 100 fold return and all this kind of thing. Really, if you want to get wealthy like them, all you have to do is own up a fellowship, teach everybody to tithe, Give them what they want, smoke machines and theatrical productions and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you'll be a millionaire. You look, it's true. You see these, these guys leading these churches, they haven't got a clue about doctrine or, or theology or anything else. They wouldn't earn a crust out in the real world. And they're millionaires. He says, wait for that hundredfold return. Now that's the only thing that they actually said truthful, because you will wait, because God has never said anything like that. In fact, God's word states the exact opposite. In Philippians 4, uh, verses 10 onwards, this is Paul speaking, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you care, speaking to a fellowship for me, has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So Paul was struggling, basically, and he's saying to the you know, this church wanted to help him out. Not that, I, this is his word, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. How I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. In other words, you know how to have nothing and how to have plenty. Doesn't matter to him, he's content wherever he is. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. 
Some of these uh, modern day preachers have never been hungry in their life. Both who are bound unto suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? I can do all things through Christ. All right, okay, you're going to live in poverty then. Because what they really mean is, like, oh, they, you know, they can do all things, can't they, kind of thing. But in this context, what's Paul saying about? Yeah? He's talking about going through adversity. In fact, Paul tells us then in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And I know you that you know that to be true. But some people asked, didn't they? They said, well, I wonder how much he left at a funeral. And Martin said, everything. Couldn't take anything, could he? So it goes on, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which for which some have strayed, and from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves with many sorrows. I'm just about done. Now, who would have thought this would be the sin of leaders in the churches eventually? Who should have been set an example for the flock? Blows my mind. Bible teaches exactly the opposite to what these many preachers are preaching. And what are they doing? They pierce in the people with all sorts of sorrows, trying to attain wealth. There's nothing wrong with having lots of money, but with lots of money comes greater responsibility at the end of the day. So there are very few fellowships that are holding to the truth. So I'm armoring the Protestants, and I'll be saying something against Roman Catholicism. I'll be saying something against all major denominations when we come to looking at this. It's not my intention to upset anyone. But the truth is the truth. Jesus offended some people with the truth. So there's not many old into it. Most that do are small. And even decreasing in number, the way I see it. You know, they've gone preaching to other fellowships. The ones that are all into the truth, they're not growing. If you stick to Jesus' formula for church growth, what do you think is going to happen? You wear a lip as our Lord did. Nobody was following him in the end. But at least we know that by holding to his truth, the real truth, we will finish the race and receive a reward that we don't deserve. Amen. Amen.